Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Philip D'Souza, and I work for Atom Consulting, a water and environmental consultancy based in Sydney, Australia. I'm also the current co-chair of the IWA Water Safety Planning Specialist Group. Today's webinar is entitled Advancing Water Safety Planning, Global Practices and Challenges. And we have four panelists who will be sharing their experiences with us. Our specialist group is thrilled to be hosting this webinar for you. And just to note that uh, we have uh, 286 participants from 80 countries who have registered for this webinar. So it seems as our topic is both relevant and needed. And we hope that we can provide some insights to challenges you might be facing, which is the aim of our specialist group. If you have not yet joined our specialist group, please do so via IWA Connect. So why this webinar? As you may be aware, the second edition of the WHO IWA Water Safety Planning Manual was released last year in 2023 and refle reflects the practical water safety planning experiences gained from around the globe. In essence, we have seen that many water utilities and municipalities continue to struggle with opera operationalization of water safety plans, making it part of the day-to-day -day embedded activities. Through this webinar, we aim to share the experiences and challenges in developing, implementing, and sustaining water safety planning practices by utilities from various geographies and with varying states of water safety planning maturity. First, we will have Rory McEwen from the World Health Organization, followed by Annette Davison from Australia, Alejandro Araburu from Uruguay, and then Mara Ramos from Brazil. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and be made available after. And just a little bit of housekeeping to note that uh, you will all be muted during this webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box, which you'll find in your Zoom control panel, which is at the bottom of the screen. I'll bring these questions up at the end of the presentations and we will work together through them with the panelists. Please do not post any questions in the chat as this is reserved for other webinar related issues, such as checking sound and connections and so forth. I would also like to draw your attention to the IWA Water Safety Planning Conference, which will take place in Montevideo, Uruguay from the 4th to the 6th of September this year, 2024. The program includes oral and poster presentations, specialist workshops, and also a technical tour. Um, everybody is looking forward to welcoming you to Uruguay. Uh, we have the IWA, OSA, the university, uh, of the University of, of the Republic, um, the engineering faculty there, and also uh, the Ricaldoni Foundation. Um, so please, if you can join us, that would be wonderful. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to jump to our, our first uh, speaker, um, and that's going to be Dr. Rory Moses McEwen. Uh, Rory is well known within water safety planning community. He has over 15 years of experience in drinking water quality and public health. He currently works with the water and climate team at the European Centre for Environment and Health for the WHO regional office in Europe. And prior to this, he has worked in the water industry in Australia. He's been responsible for operations and risk management for water, wastewater and recycled water products and as an academic in the field of environmental microbiology. Rory, over to you. Okay, that's great, Philip. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, and thanks to you all for your kind attention. Uh, it's great to see such a global spread of participants in the chat. Uh, and hello to the familiar names and faces that I know in there. And, and nice to meet the rest of you. So my aim now really is just to give you a very brief flavor of some of the latest trends and developments in water safety planning across the globe uh, from WHO's perspective. So next slide, please. 
Uh, I'll start at the most zoomed out global level uh, with the sustainable development goals. So we're now well past the halfway point uh, of the SDG era. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, uh, of course, uh, if we're to stay on track to, to meet these goals in, in many regions. Um, but this SDG agenda is really continuing to shine a light on water safety planning across all WHO regions. So many of us will be aware that SDG 6 for clean water and sanitation has been focusing on the indicator safely managed drinking water services. And this has been driving uh, increased political will and of course increased attention on proactive approaches and risk-based ways of managing uh, drinking water safely. And this in turn has been fueling uh, a lot of interest in water safety planning globally. Uh, next slide, please. And it's very clear um, and there's growing recognition of the importance of a strong enabling environment to help support the sustainable implementation of water safety plans over the longer term. Now, this has included more robust policy instruments, such as drinking water quality regulations or standards that would require or promote water safety planning, right through to strengthened drinking water quality surveillance and monitoring programs and early warning detection systems. Now, one of the best examples of this strengthened policy environment comes from our European region, where the re cast European Union drinking water directive is, as we speak, uh, being transposed into national legislation in all 27 member states. So this, for the first time, is providing a legal basis for water suppliers to undertake uh, risk management uh, in line with the principles of water safety planning. Now, we've also recently supported uh, Sri Lanka in our Southeast Asian region with the revision of their national policy on water safety planning, which now includes a greater focus on climate resilience. I'll talk a little bit more about the climate resilient element later. And another example from Morocco in the Eastern Mediterranean region which has recently completed a, a longer term program to institutionalize water safety plans nationally. And this example is being served as a model and is gaining traction with a lot of interest across this region uh, to, to follow suit. So next slide, please. And in line with the SDG ethos of leaving no one behind, uh, water safety planning we're seeing is being increasingly used to ensure that equitable benefit is being derived from the process. And this means sort of benefit by all users of the system. Now we know that people experiencing different sources of vulnerability and marginalization are more likely to lack access to safe drinking water. And the water safety plan framework can be used to give careful and due consideration to vulnerable and disadvantaged populations. And this helps to ensure that appropriate measures are being put in place for more equitable public health gains to be made. And this has been a particular focus in our Western Pacific region for the past few years. Uh, next slide, please. And the challenges that water suppliers are facing in the threat of a, a changing and uncertain climate um, has been a key entry point for the uptake of water safety plans. Now, this challenge is truly global um, and is evident across all six WHO regions. Um, but the work in this area has been particularly evident in regions that are most affected and least well able to cope with the impacts from a changing climate. So this includes our Western Pacific region, our African region, uh, including Mali as a particular example, where one of our most recent piloting work is taking place on uh, more climate resilient water safety plans. And also, of course, the Southeast Asia region, uh, this latter region is, of course, currently experiencing unprecedented heat waves, and all of this is underscoring the need for a more, you know, systematic consideration of all threats within a water supply system, including those from extreme weather and a changing climate. Now, next slide, please. And these challenges from climate change that I've talked about, uh, coupled with other external pressures 
pressures such as um, you know, population growth, migration, urbanization, all of which is really beginning to drive the safe management of water and sanitation systems closer together than ever. Now, the importance of a safely managed sanitation chain within drinking water catchments is a critical source protection measure, as I'm sure you'd all agree. And all of this is driving growing interest in a more holistic approach to drinking water and sanitation management. Now, the integration of water safety planning and sanitation safety planning has been well and truly underway in a number of regions uh, across the globe. Um, we have recent country examples of this combined water and sanitation safety planning. And this has been taking place in South Africa, India, Vanuatu, and in the Balkan regions in Europe. So next slide, please. Now, if we take all of these recent drivers into account, a global snapshot of water safety plans is showing us that over 90 countries are implementing at least one water safety plan or an equivalent risk management approach. Now, this has been helped by regional initiatives that have been supporting uptake. Uh, for example, our Pan American region has been including water safety planning as a key performance indicator for all countries within the region. And a target has been set for water safety plan implementation in at least 20% of cities with at least 10% of the national population covered. So this is a set target. And I understand there are equivalent KPIs being applied in other regions, including our African region. And very encouragingly, we have seen a recent surge in the number of WSP related policies. So we have now around 80 policies that have been approved that either require or promote water safety plans. And there's many more countries have these types of policies in development. Next slide, please. However, uh, in many of these countries that are covered by WSP policies or regulations, there is limited water safety plan quality assurance schemes in place. So this might include a national scheme for WSP auditing. Now auditing, as we know, can help ensure that a water safety plan is complete, it's adequately implemented in practice, and above all, it is effective. Now, a robust program of auditing is really key to support the progressive strengthening of water safety plans and their effective implementation over the longer term. Next slide, please. So we've seen many countries recently citing a lack of regulatory enforcement as a key barrier to WSP uptake. And many countries are not actively conducting any form of water safety plan audits, you know, be they formal or informal auditing. So many countries are now realizing the potential and the significant opportunity that exists to strengthen WSP implementation, okay, to benefit from its impacts and improve sustainability through increased attention to auditing. Now, this has been a big focus in our European region and Southeast Asia regions lately. And taking uh, Sri Lanka again as an example, they have just completed drafting their national uh, guidelines for the development, implementation and auditing of water safety plans, with many other countries now embarking on a similar path. And uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Aaron. So in terms of guidance, our global WSP uptake has been supported by new materials, uh, including the second edition of the WSP manual, uh, which Philip has mentioned. And this has been showing strong uptake since its launch in 2023. Now, a quick check of the recent stats uh, right before the webinar started uh, showed that we have over 6,000 downloads from the WHO website just over the past six months uh, and I should note this excludes downloads from other significant sources such as our partner and uh, uh, co-publisher the IWA and also from our water safety portal. Now this um, second edition of the manual has prompted a, a program of review of existing regional and national WSP training programs. So for example, a virtual uh, WSP self-learning program that has been developed for countries in our Pan American region and also an online introductory course, which I'll talk about just in a few slides time. So we're currently working with our partners, IWA, to develop a global WSP training package that's based on the second edition of the manual. And we're also soon to be delivering much anticipated translations of the new manual 
Um, I understand currently Chinese, French and Spanish translations are under development and there will be more in the pipeline to follow. Now, in small water supplies, so stepping away from the urban area into more, you know, small rural urban settings, we have our companion WSP guidance, including the second edition of the WSP field guide from our regional office in Europe. And this includes some very basic and handy templates that will help folks get started on their WSP journey. Now, next slide, please. And we'll continue with our focus on small water supplies. So the SDG agenda has really shown that brighter light on the particular support needs for small supplies, uh, given the many common uh, challenges that they face and the need for a more tailored approach to risk management in these settings. So to try and answer this call, uh, WHO has just published earlier this year, our guidelines for uh, drinking water quality in small water supplies and supporting tools, the sanitary inspection packages. Now, these materials include new and more nuanced guidance for water safety planning that's tailored to small system types. So it includes common uh, management types of small systems. So this includes household managed, community managed, or professionally managed small water supplies. And the guidance now includes promotion of the role of sanitary inspection as an interim risk management tool while WSP capacity is being developed uh, or all alternatively using sanitary inspections as an alternative approach to water safety planning in some settings. So for example, in household managed water supplies where capacities and resources are typically severely restrained and a full water safety plan uh, may be impractical to consider. So sanitary inspections can be a useful basic risk management tool in these settings. And we're also seeing innovation in this small supply space, uh, including a novel community-led water security and improvement planning in the Solomon Islands, which has a stronger focus on social cohesion and social contact in order to drive results. So next slide, please. And I'll just finish up now by mentioning that we're offering an introductory course on our free online learning platform, uh, the Open WHO. And this is on water safety planning for urban water supply systems. So this was originally developed um, uh, through our uh, Southeast Asian office, but it's being presented to you as a, a global training package. Um, it's self-paced. It's only a two hour online course and it outlines the principles and steps of the water safety planning approach and presents some of the key success factors that really underpin effective and sustainable implementation. And this course is fully aligned with the second edition of the WSP manual. And last slide, please. Uh, with apologies if I may have overspoken uh, a little bit, but uh, I hope this all gives you a taste of what's currently topical within the global uh, WSP community. I have a QR link here to all of the resources that I've uh, presented on the WHO website. And I'll finish up by saying uh, that Despite some of the recent successes that we've prevented, um, sorry, <laughs> presented on the WSP front globally, uh, there still are many challenges. Uh, we're, we're not afraid to, to shy away from that statement. So I look forward to, to learning more about the approaches that the countries are taking to overcome these challenges. And I'm sure that we'll all learn a, a very great deal from the case studies that are to follow. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Rory, and uh, for highlighting where we are, um, for reintroducing water safety planning to everybody, for also showing us that there are courses out there that uh, people can uh, look at. So those who are just starting their journey, um, please uh, refer to uh, the link that uh, is there in the chat. Um, we'll now move on to Annette Davison. Dr. Annette Davison is a microbiologist and a paralegal with over 30 years of experience in the water environment and biotechnology industries. She is the founder and co-CEO of Risk Edge, a risk management company. Um, Annette has sat on many committees and boards, including the Australian Water Association Board. She's a lead auditor for water quality management systems and an author of key state, national and international water cycle guidance documents, including the New South Wales 
um, drinking water management system guideline, the New South Wales drinking water management system audit and review guideline, and WHO's water safety plan guidance. Annette, over to you. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, before I start, I'd really like to thank Ahsoka Jayaratna for putting me up for this talk as well. And I'd also like to recognise some uh, quite a lot of colleagues actually from Australia who've been really instrumental in developing the whole water safety plan concept and getting it to where it is now. And that's Melita Stevens, Dan Deer, David Sheehan, David Cunliffe and Don Bursall way, way back in the day as well. So I just wanted to recognise that I'm giving the talk, but it's really on behalf of quite a lot of people here in Australia. So um, Australia is one of the more, I, I guess, one of the more mature countries who, who are developing, uh, have developed water safety plans. So I'd like to talk about that today. So it's water safety planning, a view from Australia. Let's see if I can get this to work, Erin. There we go. So just in terms of um, an overview then, I'd, I'd quickly like to go over a bit of a, a potted history because I think it's useful to see where we've come from um, to, you know, to have a bit of a look back and see, see where we are now as well. Then I'm going to give a bit of a picture of Australia because it, from a jurisdictional perspective, it's probably one of the more complicated jurisdictions for, for water management. So that's the it's complicated bit. Then I'll move on to talking about where Australia is now and then move into a case study. And with the case study, I'm going to talk a, quite a, um, a bit about the, the digital side of things and also critical control points. So critical control points aren't specifically in the water safety plan, but they are very much a, an instrumental and central part of the, the way that we um implement risk management and water safety plans in Australia. So I'll talk about that and then I'll wrap up with some of the key points at the end. Okay, so in my potted history, uh, I'd like to talk about the rise of sanitation and then also the way that we've moved from QC to QA, so quality control to quality assurance. So I know I'll be teaching you to suck eggs, a lot of people who are on the, the webinar today, but I thought it was useful just to um, step back and have a bit of a look. So in 1829, um, we, we had the sand filter and that was used for treating drinking water in London. We all know about Do Dr. John Snow, who was one of the first epidemiologists. He took the Broad Street pump handle off. He found that that was the, the Broad Street pump was the source of waterborne disease. Then we started looking at, um, you know, pulling in all our different indicators. So Klebsiella, we found cholera, we found our old friend E. coli, which still serves as well today as an indicator. And then we started looking at different types of disinfecting processes. So we had a, a, a physical barrier with sand filtration. And then we started looking at disinfection. So we had ozone coming in in France. And then um, finally we had uh, chlorinations um, coming in, which protected London from a typhoid outbreak. So that just gives a bit of a like a potted history of some of the um, historical perspectives in drinking water quality risk management. And then I think it was probably around about 1998 when we had the famous Cryptosporidium and Giardia contamination incident in Sydney. That's when we first started talking about um, but, you know, the, the whole idea of risk management for the water industry. And of course, the food industry was well ahead of us. It had already thought about HACCP, it already developed HACCP, um, hazard analysis and critical control points. But it was really the first time that we were starting to think in Australia about um, implementing risk management for our water supplies. And then in the early 2000s, Risk was actually introduced to drinking water guidelines through the, the WHO's water safety plan, our own Australian drinking water guidelines. That, like It was a pretty massive shakeup at the time for our guidelines in 2004 to have the framework for management of drinking water quality. It, it was really massive. And then, of course, we had the Bond Charter and others as well. 
But at the heart of this, it, it's all about risk and risk is the impact of uncertainty on achieving your objectives. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to reduce that uncertainty and use a more risk-informed approach in everything we do. And, and finally, to get to a point where we're actually implementing continuous improvement. So to boil that down, it's really about uh, looking at the risk context. And I always tell people that if the risk, risk context is really where it is. If we don't get the risk context right, then everything else we can forget about it. From that, we can do our risk identification and assessment, look at our risk management, our risk oversight, and then down the bottom, our risk foundations. So this is where the it's complicated bit comes in. So I'm going to talk about the Australian context and then talk about a, a, a universal framework that we, we have been developing. And that's important because each jurisdiction has its own requirements. So, so we've got the water safety plan, but then we've got different bits and pieces around the place. So in Australia, we have a 12 element framework. In New Zealand, for instance, they have a 10 component framework. So we wanted to bring something that was a bit more universal and, and include critical control points. So I'll talk about that briefly. So, in Australia, generally the framework applies, but each Australian jurisdiction has its own drinking water quality risk management requirements. And within that too, there are also some nuances that we have to be aware of. And so uh, consulting across Australia and also globally as well, it's really important that you understand the operating context that you find yourself in. So here are just some examples. So Western Australia, there's a model drinking water quality management plan. Nationally, we've got our Australian drinking water guidelines, ISO 31000, the global risk management standard also applies. Then in Victoria, we've got the Safe Drinking Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Regulations, which I believe are, are currently under review and they have to have a risk management plan. And then up in Queensland, we've got the Water Supply Safety and Reliability Act, and they, they have to have a drinking water quality management plan. There's also guidance and auditing requirements there. And then in New South Wales, which is my home state, it becomes even more complicated because we've got a range of utilities. We've got the metro utilities like Sydney Water, like um, Water New South Wales, Hunter Water, and they all operate under operating license requirements. We also have private utilities and they operate under the Water Industry Competition Act. Then we have a bunch of, you know, all sorts of other different water suppliers too, um, operating under different acts. So the Local Government Act, the Water Management Act, um, different, uh, lots of different acts. But at the end of the day, if, you're not operating under either an operating license or a, a private license, then you have to have a quality assurance program under the public health regulation. And that's based on the framework for management of drinking water quality. But across, uh, across the country, uh, we do have now fairly mature auditing around the place as well. It's more mature in some states than others. For instance, New South Wales is, is very mature for the metro utilities and it's just starting its journey for the local water utilities. So given that diagram that I showed you before, we've put together some, I guess, pulled out some more of the detail about what, what we would see in a management framework. And I'll talk more about what some of the bits and pieces of this look like in a second. But what I want you to do is pull your eye to these critical control points here. So that's something that's um, not specifically in the water safety plan. It's definitely covered in terms of things like critical limits, but not specifically critical control points. But it is fundamental to the way that we do things in Australia and New Zealand now. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so where is Australia now then? So I wanted to talk about some of the things that we see in a mature system. And then I'll, I'd also like to talk about a water management system maturity journey. 
So this is that same diagram that I showed you before, but it now shows you some of the outputs of the things that we would expect to see. So we, um, if you're looking at risk context, we'd be expecting to see something like a water products and services register. Now that's really important because in terms of implementation, we we often find that where um, that utilities aren't properly identifying their water products and services, and that can create a, a, um, certainly um, quite, a, quite a bit of uncertainty there in the way that it's managed. We'd expect to be seeing a stakeholder register, compliance register of some description, what we call a governogram, and so that's really about the governance of where the water's coming from, where it's going to, and how the custody changes. Uh, obviously, system descriptions, water quality trends, and then things like critical control point tables, log reduction value tables. We've just gone through another change in our Australian drinking water guidelines. We now have health-based targets introduced as part of that. So that's essentially understanding the catchment that your water comes from and how you need to treat it. And as you can see, as you move around, there are lots of different things that you'd be expecting to see in what we would call a sound uh, risk management plan. So if we look at a, a maturity journey then, if you look down the bottom, you can see we've got increasing certainty in achieving our objectives. And so if we look at our steps, so we'll go all the way from initialization, which would be ad hoc, verbal and relationship-based processes. And the poll that Philip put up before, we saw that there was quite quite a, a difference of um, people who were on their journey. So you might just be starting out. You might be developing procedures. So you might be here at, um, in this block. You might be starting to consolidate. You might be uh, around this block here, block four, where you're now starting to get good measurement and assurance around what you're doing. Or you might be in optimization. So if we look at Australia, I would say that most of our, our utilities fit within block three and block four here, but some are moving into block five as well. The other thing I wanted to point out as well is that this is just a generalized source to endpoint diagram. In, in Australia now, we're now starting to close the loop somewhat by bringing in purified recycled water as well. And that's where we're treating water from sewage, for instance, and bringing it back into the drinking water system. So not, not only have we got things like surface water catchments, marine catchments, we're now looking at sewer catchments. In terms of collection systems, it's not just dams and lakes anymore. We're also looking at things like sewerage systems, drainage systems. Transfer is fairly, um, fairly obvious. Treatment will depend on the type of the source water that you're drawing from. And then distribution. The distribution systems are, are still need a lot of love, in my opinion. And we can see that with what's going on in Brixham in Devon in the UK at the moment with the cryptosporidium contamination. So we still have a lot of problem with, with the dis distribution systems. And then finally, um, uh, at the end point with, with our customer's tap or the meter, or indeed going back to the source as well. So I wanted to talk about Bathurst Regional Council uh, as my case study in particular. So it's a small utility located in central New South Wales. Um, it's been in the game for a while. So in, in 1886, it became the first regional town with a pipe town water supply, actually. And it provides a range of water products and services. And it's got 40... Uh, approximately 43,000 residents. So it's a significant place. Now this, as I mentioned before about the, it's complicated bit. So council operates under the um, Public Health Act. And in 2019, it embarked on a digital maturity journey. So as of 2014, local water utilities in New South Wales had to have a, a essentially a quality assurance program or a drinking water management system in place. So Bathurst was one of the, the ones jumping on that uh, fairly quickly. And now it's started on its digital maturity journey to because it's been collecting heaps of data, um, but it needed to be able to do something with the data. 
So we've been working with them and I'll show you two examples. So one for critical control point oversight and one for harmful algal blooms. So this top diagram here is a SCADA trace, so um, supervisory control and data acquisition. And so it used to take one person uh, one day a week to be able to interrogate the, the SCADA data for the week and develop a report that looked like this. So we've been working with them and Sarah Loder, who's on the call, um, sorry, on the webinar as well, was instrumental in developing some of the code um, that sits behind this um, and some of the, sorry, some of the truth logic as well. So we can now get a, a weekly and a monthly performance update in seconds. And excitingly, we've just got reservoirs automated as well. So we can take inspection data and automate that through to this type of report. And then sitting under um, what we affectionately call those lollipops, there's a whole heap of richer data as well and information that's all automatically generated. And I said, as I said, we've just got reservoirs automated as well. And that's been helping to drive, interestingly, helping to drive a lot of behavioral change as well, not just with the transparency of the, the water quality information, but people actually can put two and two together now and see the importance of what they do. So it's been really quite transformative. So we can now get a weekly report in seconds. And for this utility, it's great because it gives them a real uh, efficiency increase, which frees them up to do other things uh, on their water safety planning journey as well. And then harmful algal blooms are, be are becoming a real problem. So the report that Bathurst used to get looks something like this, and it would take one person around about a quarter of a day a week to do the interpretation, um, as long as it wasn't sitting on a fax somewhere. But now we can get um, automation. So the ranger takes a sample, sample goes up to the lab, the results come directly back into the portal. Uh, we've got automation of the results in seconds and we, we can generate, got that heat map generated as well. So you can see here we've got the, um, the, the yearly trace and horizontally we've got the monthly trace. And you can see the, um, the effects of the bloom quite nicely there. So just to wrap up, some of the key takeaways then. I think it's important to step back and have a look back and we really have come a long way. And, and that risk management focus has really changed the way I think we provide all our water products and services now and it's something that we can apply across the water cycle. It's important to understand the context when, water, when you're water safety planning and that's the context with your system your jurisdictional context, your operating context, everything. If you don't get that bit right, then you won't get the rest of it right. I think what we've developed now is a really nice lead-in and smart practice playbook that we can use to apply to all sorts of water products and services. And I really wanted to stress as well that even smaller utilities can lead the way in moving along the water management system maturity journey, as I hope I've been able to show you today. Uh, thank you very much for your um, attention, everybody, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Annette, and thanks for sharing the journey that uh, Australia has undertaken so far and also that it's uh, always a work in progress. You know, there's always uh, some additional work to be done. So thanks very much for sharing. Um, yeah, next you. up, next up, we're going to have uh, Alejandro Eroburu. Um, Alejandro is a civil engineer with an environmental hydraulic uh, background. And he has over 25 years of experience in the treatment and management of drinking water. He's currently the drinking water assistant managers at OSA, who is the Uruguay's uh, national water supply and sanitation company. Since uh, 2012, he has coordinated water safety planning at OSA and has supported the supply systems um, staff with the design, development and implementation of water safety planning. He has been responsible for the startup and training of personnel in more than 20 autonomous water treatment plants um, uh, within Uruguay and other different uh, Latin American countries. Um, 
He is a member of the Inter-American ADIS. He's a vice president of the uh, four region and president of the Uruguayan chapter. He's a member of IWA and he has participated in the program committee for the water safety conference that was held in Norvik in 2022. And he is also a, a leading force behind the water safety conference, um, which will be happening in Montevideo in 2024 in September. Alejandro, over to you. Good afternoon. Thanks, Philip, for that introduction. And thanks to IWA and especially to the Water Safety Specialist Group for the opportunity of sharing with you the Uruguayan experience in the development of water safety plans. Uh, Uruguay is a country located in South America between Argentina and Brazil. It covers an area of uh, 176,220 uh, square kilometers and has a population of 3.44 million inhabitants and has more than 98% uh, of drinking water supply coverage. Uh, talking about drinking water in Uruguay uh, since 1952, Obras Sanitarias del Estado, OSE, the National Administration of Sanitary Works, is the national public company responsible um, for supplying drinking water uh, throughout the country and manages almost uh, 570 water supply systems, of which 90% have less than 5,000 inhabitants and 50% have less than 100 inhabitants. This small system includes rural schools and small rural towns. The drinking water pipe network length is about uh, 70,800 kilometers and has more than 1,138,000 potable water connection and a total annual production of more than um, 360 million of cubic meters. Uh, let me see. This is. Uh, in, in the right image, you have uh, the uh, water supply system and where they're located and the information about uh, Uruguay location in South America. Um, let's see for the other one here. Okay. Uh, let me see, sorry. Uh, talking about uh, uh, this, this uh, kind of things that it's uh, about water governance in, in Uruguay, uh, let, let me show what, what is here. Uh, concerning the governance on the water sector, uh, the executive, executive branch is the National Water Authority and the one that formulates the national water policy. Uh, water policy is proposed by the Minister, Minister of Environment, also responsible for the administration use and control of water resources and the control of compliance with environmental protection standards. Uh, the health uh, basic tertiary control standards are established by the Minister of Public Health and the independent surveillance is carried out by USEA, that is the regulator. Uh, with implementation of water safety plan, the requirements set out in the framework for safe drinking water are will be met. The framework for safe drinking water first established in uh, 2004 by the WHO, providing a preventive management approach comprising the component of health basis target, uh, a comprehensive, comprehensive risk assessment and risk management approach, and obviously a system of independent surveillance that verified that drinking water safety is warranted by implementation of a water safety plan. Let, let's talk about um, how we start to be involved in water safety plan. Uh, taking into account the recommendation of WHO guidelines, the utility also has uh, been going through a process in order to incorporate water safety plan in its water supply system. We can distinguish three phases in the process. The first phase uh, from uh, 2006 to 2011 uh, focuses in learn, raise awareness and encourage adoption of the water safety plan approach in the company. This included the study of the WHO and IWA document as well as technical publish publication, writing by sports companies and association. Uh, progress 
uh, was also made in the training of staff in hazard analysis, critical control points as the a theory, theoretical basis and uh, ISO 9001, in addition to certifying a water treatment plant with the uh, mentioned uh, ISO management system. The water treatment plant selected to be certified by uh, ISO 9001 uh, was part of the same water supply system that was later going to be selected as the first pilot for a uh, water safety plan. Uh, continue with this, uh, we, we, we enter in, in the second uh, phase that we, we call this one uh, like the voluntary implementation of water safety plan. Uh, in, in these times, uh, um, we, we started in, in 2012 uh, through workshop that included, in addition to the work of local technicians, the participation of specialists with experience in the development of applied methodologies and implementation of water safety plan in Portugal. Uh, uh, Two things, uh, two important things, things was, uh, were defined in 2012. On the one hand, the mandatory documents to be drawn up for each water safety plan, and on the other, uh, the structure adopted for the development. Uh, it was defining an organizational structure that reflects the national scale of OSE, it, uh, the centralized production and the existence of a large number of water supply systems incorporating the model suggested by the WHO in the fourth edition of the manual. Uh, this, this is um, Uruguay and the uh, administrative division in department. And also in OSE, we have the, the same uh, kind of division uh, with um, technic technician chief in each department and uh, management, uh, regional manage management. Uh, about the uh, in the right side of the uh, of this, the um, we have the the way that we choose um, to the structure we adopted for development of water safety plans. Uh, we we decide to have a, a WSP national support committee responsible for monitoring the implementation of water safety plan and report the results to the board of directors. Uh, this is uh, integrated by the general management, regional management, drinking water and laboratory management, and the coordinator of water safety plan. Also, we have our uh, department work teams that cover uh, all the water supply system uh, for each department, and also the local work teams. And this this one, these local work teams uh, that represent each drinking water system. Uh, are the responsible for uh, 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 redact and carry on the water safety plan in, in each of them. Uh, also, we have a water safety plan technical secretary with the water safety plan coordinator, technical specialist, uh, and the function is to prepare general documents to coordinate action and provide technical support to all the system in the development of the water safety plan. As you can see in the center map during the phase of voluntary implementation of WSP, the dissemination strategy, strategy uh, was tested with the objective of having as soon as possible at least one water supply system with WSP implemented in each department. Uh, the, this action was also accompanied by training courses and workshop in order to get the staff involved in the thematics. Uh, one thing that uh, happened in 2017, that uh, is the start of the ending of this phase, is uh, the, the, the government approved the National Water Plan uh, uh, between his programs, between the programs of the National uh, Water Plan, there is one about the incorporation of water safety plans methodology as a tool uh, promoted by the WHO. Uh, and a goal was defined to implement by the by OSE, by, by the water utility, uh, 22 water safety plan in the third year and 52 in the eighth year of uh, the uh, natural water plan implementation. 
this national water plan and its associated goals uh, as an external requirement of the Minister of Housing, Territorial Planning and Environment begins to define the change between the voluntary and the mandatory phase. Let's see what happened in the survey phase. And here we have, uh, sorry, uh, in 2018, uh, the Uruguayan regulator for energy and water safe, safe uh, services promulgated a regulation intended to ens ensure a strategy that supports and promotes the water safety plan implementation and auditing in all drinking water supply system by 2030, considering an interim target for the implementation in 60% of the water system by uh, 2025. Water safety plan regulation establish a legislative and institutional basis for effective drinking water surveillance that promotes risk assessment and risk management in all water system, from the raw water sources to consumer and throughout the country and establish internal and external audits as mandatory surveillance instruments. Here you have on the right image, uh, the surface, surface source water treatment plant in Uruguay. Uh, in OSE uh, manage uh, more than 60 uh, surface source water treatment plants and uh, they represent uh, annually the 90% of the total water that the uh, utility produce. The other 10% come from underground sources. Uh, this is important uh, to the thing that I, I will comment you uh, next, uh, because uh, uh, um, to support to, to support the, the the water safety plan, uh, ad, ad hoc computer application were developed by the OSE Information Technology Management, and the staff was trained in their use. Uh, they enabled the management of operational data associated with the source treatment and distribution components, complementing and integrating the application already active, allowing, among other things. Uh, an early warning of water quality changes in source is one of the uh, important things that we can do with this. Uh, sorry. Uh, with this application. Uh, for example, this image came from a tool developed to support implementation of water safety planning in order to improve the management and integration of shared operational data for water treatment plants whose source water came from the same catchment area. As you see here, uh, these blue points are, are different uh, water treatment plants, and this is the what, what the operator uh, can see in in and uh, here they start to introduce information data about uh, what is happening in raw water, what changes are they experiment. In the central graph, you can see an example of how changes in raw water turbidity can be estimated early, sharing with data between two water treatment plants in the same river. We have like uh, one plant over here and the other over there, and this is how the turbidity uh, is measured in, in one of them, and this is what happened in the other, and they can prevent in advance uh, what is going to happen and change uh, operational uh, treatment. Uh, then, uh, sorry. Uh, another su uh, supporting program that it is important to share with you are uh, training on water safety planning. Since 2015, a training program was established with courses on the water safety plan methodology uh, with an average of two editions per year. More than 120 participants have been trained. The, the courses go through the step described in the WHO manual and the, its links with the articles of the regulation, of the Hawaiian regulation. The approach included uh, a journey from source to consumer from a multidisciplinary vision with the participation of instructor from the areas of biology, geology, and engineering. Also, uh, workshop and in-person and virtual meetings were held, especially this virtual meeting established after the COVID-19 pandemic. 
those uh, activities are promoted by the technical secretary with the local work teams, deepening the role of each one of the actor and the responsibility in the sustain sustainability of the program. An annual meeting of water production supervisor is also held uh, with water safety plan as a key framework. The scope uh, allows staff from each water safety plan departmental team to meet, to share experience, lesson learners, and learn about proposal from, for improvement in the subject. And let's talk about uh, uh, conference plan platform meeting. Uh, learning and adaption, this is what's uh, no easy, but learning and adaption to use the uh, use of virtual meeting platform by the company staff has made possible to intensify the frequency of meetings between the technical secretary and the local work teams and move forward in an agile manner to be able to comply with the schedule of water safety plan implementation established by the regulator. The mesh on the right shows the virtual meeting between the technical secretary and the local group of San Gregorio de Polanco during the preparation of, the, of uh, his water safety plan documents. Yeah. Here also uh, we have uh, a repository of uh, an application that is this, uh, repository of uh, documents. And one of the functions of the technical secretary is the development of general procedures in order to facilitate and standardize the development of the water safety plan at the level of the local working groups. An application was also developed to, uh, among other things, house general documents that are accessible to local teams as well as local, local documents uh, once approved. Here we have an example of what the, the person is seeing here. And about the results obtained, uh, here we have the map of Uruguay and we will be sharing uh, how, um, the, how was the way uh, year by year uh, from 2018, that was the year when the uh, regulator uh, uh, published uh, the regulation and how uh, along the years, uh, the number of water safety plan uh, started to be increased. In 2018, these are the 10 uh, implemented, these are the, the system where uh, water safety plan uh, was implemented. If we see here, uh, this graph, uh, we will be seeing uh, this, uh, how, how this was started to advance. And uh, in population with uh, served with a system when water safety plan is implemented, and uh, uh, the accumulative of uh, water safety plan uh, in, in water uh, supply system. Uh, we have like, as I told you before, 10 uh, implemented water safety plan in uh, 2018. And sorry. here we have uh, next year, uh, the, the number of implemented, uh, you, you also see how they are, how they are distributed, how they are dist uh, geographically, geographically distributed. This is what happened in 20, um, in the second year, uh, 2019. Then uh, the other thing that, uh, that happened is that uh, here we have uh, some some issue that was a pandemic COVID nineteen pandemic, and uh, that uh, represents a, a big challenge that we have to deal with. And here we have the, the resume of of the all implemented uh, system uh, up today for uh, the this period we have at at, at, at today like one hundred and fifty six. Uh, system with implemented water safety plan. Uh, okay. um, the, um, some conclusion to, to start ending the, the presentation. Uh, one of the important things uh, that help the utility to, um, to, to accomplish with, the, with what the regulator uh, asked is uh, the previous pa path taken by Jose with his first water safety plan pilot and his subsequent dissemination 
that was key to um, meeting the initial goals set up by the regulator. Regulation of water safety plan approved by Rosea uh, really contribute to give a greater visibility to the water safety plan within OSE, fundamentally in the areas that are not directly involved, involved with the operation of the uh, treatment process, uh, valuing the WSP uh, in the management, in management, management of the company. Also, um, what, the other important thing is that uh, the work of local and departmental work teams that include personnel from technical sector, commercial operation, and regional laboratories favors better synergy between related process and promote more efficient management. The other thing is that uh, management of the result of operational monitoring constitute an important challenge in the sense that uh, maintenance of the computer tool developed by the company, the management of the online equipment and the transmission of the result obtained as well as the continuous training and motivation of staff uh, are keys to the su sustainability of the water safety plan. Uh, the other very important things are uh, the audit program that uh, Ursea uh, started to, to, to do. Uh, we are uh, just nowadays uh, between one, uh, one, one uh, two weeks of external audit. It has been possible to detect through the audit, audit uh, opportunity for improvement in the water safety plan already implemented as well as, as, well as in the documentation of general application. And to end, sorry. Uh, well, the second edition, as uh, Rory mentioned uh, at the beginning, the second edition of Water Safety Plan Manual is an excellent contribution to the development of the plans. The dynamics expressed in the description of each of the 10 steps aligns with the need for the uh, water safety plan to be alive and fully integrated into the daily task of the drinking water companies. Sharing experience through reading, participation in webinars, and a specific conference is a fundamental contribution to moving forward. In our case, with the goal of universalizing water safety plan in 2030, aligned with the target 6.1 of the sustainable development goals. Uh, thanks, and uh, for any question, I, I can, I, I'm here. Thanks very much, Alejandro, and for sharing all of your insights um, and the journey that uh, you have undertaken in Uruguay. Um, we are running out of time, so we're going to jump into uh, the next presentation uh, which is from Mara Ramos. We're very fortunate to have her here with us and to share some additional regulatory insights from Brazil. Um, Mara is an accomplished professional in the field of civil engineering and sanitation. She holds a degree in hydraulic engineering and masters in water resource management, and she's also got an MBA. Um, she worked for a Brazilian water and waste management company for about 30 years, and she's currently the superintendent of the AEE, which is an agency linked to the Secretary, Sec Secretariat of Environment, Infrastructure and Logistics in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Mara, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'd like to thank the Water Safety Specialist Group and Erin for being here with you and learn uh, about this very important issue. So um, as um, you said, uh, I work, I'm responsible for the water agency in Sao Paulo State, Brazil. This agency is responsible for uh, giving the right permits to all kinds of users in the state of Sao Paulo. So uh, I'd like to ask to follow the the presentation for me, please. And for those that doesn't know, São Paulo is one of the most populous Brazil Brazilian states. Uh, we have 44 million inhabitants, and it's a quarter of the Brazilian population. With a high degree of urbanization, uh, I'd like to present here for you the metropolitan region of São Paulo. This represents a major challenge of uh, water supply and sanitation services. Uh, since we have in this area, 22 million people. So this is the case study I'd like to present to you. 
Please, Erin, another slide, please. So uh, the challenges to provide the water and sanitation services in such a huge and urban area like that, you can realize. And uh, besides that, we have more than 3 million people living in irregular areas, what we used to call informal city. So uh, to supply uh, all these 22 million people, we have uh, a semi-integrated system with nine uh, huge system, as you can see in the picture here. So these nine systems are uh, partially integrated itself, okay, to provide uh, in total 80 cubic meters per second to provide water for uh, metropolitan region population. So uh, we have this uh, combined systems, but they are not similar between them. Uh, we have four systems out of these nine that uh, we can consider protected systems. And we can see in the next uh, picture uh, a detail about these four uh, systems. Uh, we can see that we have um, a huge area around the reservoirs that protect the water quality of these reservoirs. So uh, we can see a huge shift and change and difference between the, the, the reservoirs that are protected and the others that are not. So in these pictures, in this picture, we can see uh, the detail about the area that is preserved by the water supply operator in metropolitan region that is called Sabesp. Uh, so uh, this water operator uh, keeps and maintain uh, this protected area around the reservoirs, okay? Uh, it represents 35,000 hectares of area uh, protected and uh, that keep uh, and avoid uh, to, to have uh, pollutants carrying on uh, to the reservoirs. So as we discussed uh, by our uh, previous panelists, managing water is managing risks and also uncertainties. Uh, the water security plan for sure uh, will guarantee uh, a less uh, that we have less risks in managing this water. But I'd like to say to you that in Brazil is not, uh, is not mandatory to have a water safety plan yet. Uh, we have uh, a good improvement because in 2023, uh, we had the first uh, technical standard, the Brazilian technical standard, that uh, gives principles and guidelines from the source to the point of consumption. So uh, I think this could be a huge a shift in the water uh, supply uh, safety plans in our country. I'd like to ask Erin to show you the next uh, uh, picture. We see here uh, uh, the areas that are protected around the watersheds. Uh, that supplies the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. Here we can see uh, a reservoir that's protected. And next uh, slide, please. We can see also uh, a reservoir with a huge uh, uh, area with a forest, Atlantic forest. Uh, I'd like to say that besides uh, that avoid to have pollutants in the reservoirs, we also avoid that area being occupied irregularly. So in the next one, we are going to see that we don't have all the reservoirs protected and we can see a huge difference. In the, in the next picture, please, Erin. You see here we, we have a lot of people living almost inside a water supply reservoir. So this is not so good. Uh, and the last one, please.
uh, I'd like to bring to you uh, a regulatory uh, point of view about this uh, water safety plan. Our colleagues and panelists told us a lot of case studies uh, about the topic, and I would like to say that uh, I see a huge and important role for the water agency regard to uh, ask these water safety plans to the water operators. Uh, here, uh, we have uh, set an agenda for uh, change the rules of the water uh, agency in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we intend uh, to increase the components of the water permits in order to put some requirements uh, to, to uh, promote the water quality uh, from source to the consumption. So I think it's a huge role that the water agents can play in order to incentivate the operators to have and implement these kind of standards. Uh, this is the, our uh, commitment for two years uh, from 2024 to 2025 uh, to, to put some requirements in the water permits. Uh, just for you to realize that the, the previous watersheds uh, and water bodies that I showed you that were, that were uh, protected they were protected also because uh, we have in the water permit this kind of rule. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to improve uh, our system. And that's what I would like to show you and talk to you and hope uh, to have some questions if you, if you need to uh, discuss more about this case study. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mara, and for showing us some of the insights there from Brazil. Uh, protection of catchments are essential as a starting point for water safety planning, and the regulator and operators need to work hand in hand. Very important points. Thank you. I'm going to now quickly go to the panel members. Anything that jumped out at them, I'm going to go one by one panel members to you anything that you want to share we're going to go as we as we did our, our presentation so each of you one minute Rory do you want to share anything uh, thanks Philip yeah a lot of interesting points raised there um, a lot of them very globally applicable uh, as well to to many water suppliers so look, the one that is a particular Topic, uh, topical interest to us at the moment is around uh, self-supply, uh, how you manage risks effectively. Um, so uh, self-supply can mean different things in different contexts, but if we're looking at really taking the example of where it might be just say a household themselves is responsible, uh, they're essentially the water supplier for their own household. Um, and they would be receiving very limited support, say from government uh, agencies. They might not even be included in drinking water quality regulations. And uh, so they're, they're almost falling between the cracks of any systems that are in place. So we have had our water safety planning approach for small community supplies um, for the last number of years. But we have been doing extensive consul uh, consultation with stakeholders around the small system community and recognize that particularly safe for private wells or for a you know, having a full water safety plan is really, um, if I'm honest, impractical in many of those settings. Um, and this is really where we, we've tried to look at those different management typologies and look at more simple stripped back risk management approaches. Um, and I touched upon this role of sanitary and inspections, which are a basic field-based checklist of yes, no questions. Uh, they can be simplified significantly for lower capacity settings like households. It can even be a series of picture cards uh, approach and trying to, uh, you know, build capacity, you know, through community meetings. I see Annette was touching upon a little bit about how to engage with, with small communities and uh, to see the value and make the links between, you know, the risks and, and the public health. Um, um, in a way that's appreciated um, by, by sections of that community. So I think, again, it's 
this whole philosophy that water safety planning is flexible and it's a way of trying to strip it back to uh, a level of um uh, you know a practicality that that's suitable for any context so looking at households then just quick sort of sanitary inspections done routinely with some management actions you know not simply ticking yes or no but looking at what needs to be done and providing support for those households to address any of the priority risks that they've identified so uh, yeah that's that's probably my minute there philip great thanks rory um nice. Annette, do you want to share anything, uh, anything that jumped out at you? Yeah, for, for me, I know there were a few questions on the, you know, the, the digital side of things. And I know I talked about that as well. But for me, I, I think we still got a lot of work to do in getting the basics right, e even in a mature water safety plan country like Australia. And I think that's really been brought home just recently. And uh, with what's going on in, in Brixham in the UK as well, I, I know and, and one of the comments was about, you know, private land and private sources and contamination. And it looks like it was a damaged air valve that was on, you know, private land that allowed uh, agricultural contamination to go in. So, you know, the question is, was that asset not known by the utility? Um, and so surely you would think that by now that we had would have good plans in place to know where our assets were, if they are on private land, have we got an easement or, or have we been able to go in and actually have a chat with that private landowner and see if we can come to some sort of arrangement? So for me, it really is all about governance and and distribution systems as well. <laughs> I love a good distribution reservoir and I think we need to be able to um, it's not just about treating the water, it's about making sure when it goes into the distribution system, it still remains fit for purpose when it goes to the, the customer. So that for me is where we still need a lot of work to be done. Excellent, thank you. Um, Alejandro, anything that you wanna share? Uh, no, mainly I think that, um... We, we, I try to to share with you the Uruguayan experience um, and how's the way we 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 are advancing for for us is a a very big challenge to universalize uh, the water safety plan in the whole country and well the way we are organized by a, a company that uh, give the the su supply service for, uh, all around the country. Um, is something that help us, and also the the way that a regulator um, is uh, working, uh, and the regulation uh, has been a, a, a very good uh, uh, things for us uh, to help in make uh, the water safety plan uh, as something uh, that it can be. Uh, seen by other stakeholders, by the minister and and outside uh, the water utility. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Alejandro. Mara, I've got a, a special question for you. There, there's been a question in the q and I don't know if you've seen it. Um, have you ever assessed the benefit to the community of having protected catchments, such as improved health or reduced water bowls? Um, and do you know of any other benefits uh, of having protected catchments? Do you want to answer that? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, the water operator can realize uh, the difference between having a watershed protected or not uh, in terms of uh, costs of treatment, in terms of water quality, in terms of, of less risks. So I think all the community will gain when we have uh, good water, uh, raw water. Uh, but of course, uh, it's easier for a water operator to control uh, a water treatment plant or a water distribution uh, system. And it's not so easy to control uh, a reservoir that not always is public, like someone said also in the Q&A. So it's a difficult question. Uh, an issue when you don't have uh, public uh, areas to protect it around. And as Annette said, 
uh, I agree with her that is all about governance and it's all about public policy, uh, how uh, some region wants to uh, protect their reservoirs and their water. So I think it will be a fact of sustainability to have the watersheds protected. So I think everybody will gain with that. That's my opinion, okay? And I think the regulators could play a good role at promoting this kind of policies. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of time. Um, I see we've only got two minutes to go, so I'm going to try and wrap up quickly. We will answer uh, all of the questions that are in the Q&A. You will get feedback on that. So if you haven't, if your question hasn't been answered, uh, you can look for, forward to feedback when IWA uh, shares the recording, the presentation slides and the responses to the Q&A session. Um, just to thank again all of our panelists uh, in summary, I think we've been reminded today that water safety planning is a journey, not an event. I think everybody mentioned that. Successful water safety planning requires a continuous improvement philosophy to be implemented throughout the water utility and municipality. And that also came through in some of the responses from the participants. Successful water safety planning requires you to operationalize these principles and embed them in your day-to-day -day practices and that's not easy it takes time and um, it takes effort takes resources and no matter where you are on your water safety planning journey you you must not stop that's i think that's the key thing don't stop improving don't stop moving um, continue to share your experiences with us continue to share your experiences with each other uh, uh, with each other and let's learn let's learn from each other let's continue um, to grow and ensure that we are supplying safe water to all of our communities um, thanks again to everybody for joining us today thanks to our panelists once again sorry that we couldn't chat for longer but I think your presentations were excellent and as you can see there right at the end we hope to see you in Uruguay please join us at the water safety conference looking forward to it in September um, thanks very much everybody take care there's some additional IWA webinars that you can sign up for please uh, this is a, these are excellent learning platforms and sharing from everybody Thanks, everybody. Take care. We'll be in touch. All the best. Goodbye.